Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Lotus, President and Executive Director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event with artist Adam Normandy. During this time when it's challenging for us to meet in person, we're so glad that we can offer virtual connections. I'd like to thank our Board of Directors for their swift action this spring to make that possible. Many of them are joining us this evening, including our Chairman, Bon French, as well as Michael Schmidt, who made a lead gift for our subscription to WebEx Events, the software platform that we're running tonight. Gifts from our board and community of supporters empower everything we do at the Center, and we cannot thank you enough. We have a whole series of online programming planned for the summer and fall, and you can find details about future events on our website at railphoto-art.org, as well as Facebook and Instagram. You can also watch past events on our YouTube channel, including this one, once we've posted it later this week. And be sure to mark your calendars for Saturday, September 19th, for our second online conference of the year, when we plan to bring you railroad photography from around the world. Now, as for tonight, we are in for a real treat. Another of our board members, Peter Moss, introduced me to Adam Normandon's work back in 2013, when we were preparing an article about current trends in railroad art for our quarterly journal, Railroad Heritage. That ultimately led to Adam presenting his work at our 2017 conference in Lake Forest, Illinois, where I had the pleasure of meeting him and his wife, Allison. And I have to say, I feel a little bit of a kindred spirit with Adam because we both started out in careers that took us in one direction and then pivoted to something that we both like a lot better, I think, and is far more rewarding. And Adam can say a little bit more about that when he gets going. Uh, for my part, though, I'll just say that the first time I saw one of Adam's paintings, I thought I was looking at a photograph. Adam is a master of the photorealist style of painting. His work is about so much more than technique. In the weathered details of freight cars, in the motion of passing trains, and in the juxtapositions of the railroad industrial landscape with the natural world, Adam finds beauty, emotion, and stories that can touch each one of us. His work is exhibited at top galleries and museums across the nation, and his paintings are coveted by collectors around the world. He's joining us this evening from his home studio in Los Angeles to tell us more about what he does. Welcome, Adam Normandon. Thank you, Scott. And let me make you the presenter. All right. And I'm gonna turn my camera off and enjoy the show. And if you need me, I'm here. Great. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Adam Normandon. I'm an artist and I make realist paintings of freight trains, among a few other things. My process involves taking photographs of subjects, and then back in the studio, I interpret these images in oil and acrylic paint on canvas. I'm gonna turn my camera off too during the presentation so I don't distract you from the imagery, but I'll turn it back on at the end for the Q&A. So, bear with me here. All right. Looks good on my end, Adam. Great. So I've prepared tonight's presentation in two sections. In the first section, Living with Trains, I'll talk about where I live and how it influences the paintings that I make. Most of the photographs you will see were taken by me while in the field scouting for reference material. In the second section, Life with Art, I'll show you some recent paintings, as well as the life they go on to have after leaving my studio. Since my surrounding environment is very important in the making of my paintings, this is where I wanted to begin my story. I'm deeply influenced by where I live. The majority of my reference material is gathered in the rail yards that surround my home and my community is highly supportive of just about any creative endeavor you can think of. While the painting is done inside my studio, this is just a small part of what I do. Really, my work begins every time I step outside my front door. 
My home and studio are located on the easternmost edge of downtown Los Angeles in an area now designated as the Arts District. In the turn of the last century, my neighborhood was established as a warehouse district. Essentially, this is what we still are today, although now we have a growing residential community and all the modern conveniences that come along with it. Like most of the wonderful things in my life, I accidentally stumbled upon this neighborhood. About 12 years ago, I was shooting in a local rail yard and stopped for lunch. I had never been to this part of town at that point, so I drove around hoping to find a place to eat. I landed upon a rather peculiar cafe. It was a gorgeous day and the outdoor patio really stood apart from the worn industrial setting that I'd become accustomed to. I have a vivid recollection of that moment. I felt like I discovered something truly special and so the seeds were planted for making my home in this part of town. Of course, rail activity is abundant in this area. Tracks web throughout the community and freight cars are often parked on side streets and alleys just waiting to be put to work. I have a few favorite spots that almost always have freight cars on display at any given time. Cars like these cycle through the area on a constant basis. When it comes to photographing trains, I've learned that it's best to just seize moments as I come upon them. I often shoot with my iPhone because by the time I run home to grab my camera, the moment will be gone. Sometimes I find inspiring moments on my morning run. I don't necessarily have paintings in mind when I shoot. My strategy is simple. Shoot first, think later. Of course, a little luck and timing helps when it comes to photographing trains too. This wonderful rail bridge is just south of my home and I shoot in this area often. But aside from all the glorious trains that visit, there is also a creative spirit that coexists alongside of them. Trains and graffiti culture have always gone hand in hand. As trains come and go around here, so too does the graffiti. Each day brings something new and interesting to be discovered. Graffiti also accumulates in the surrounding streets, which makes for colorful and energetic backdrops. It also sets a tone of sorts, and I sometimes feel that I'm in a forbidden territory or an urban wasteland. Graffiti, of course, is illegal. This is very much by design since rule breaking or going against social norms is part of what graffiti is about. But in the arts district, street art is welcome and often sanctioned by the city. While murals like these are an evolutionary step beyond tagging, they are indeed done by the hands of local graffiti artists, many whose tags also adorn our streets. Historically, trains have been a part of my neighborhood since its very beginning. In fact, when there was only one station in all of LA, it was located right here in the Arts District. As I mentioned before, we've always been a commercial warehouse district. As time and industry progressed, so too did the neighborhood. As a result, we have a mix of industrial buildings from all ages, many of them trackside and designed to function in tandem with the railroad. Gently curved paseos and alleyways still remain, though most tracks have been paved over by now. Like in many other cities, the more we become gentrified, the more the past becomes repurposed or obsolete. This is another neighborhood cafe called the Daily Dose. 
It's a quiet place located in an out of the way alley and a perfect spot to grab a cup of morning coffee. This image shows what the alley was originally designed for. The arts district is haunted by ghosts like this. They're not so hard to spot when you look for them. I've been looking for a good vintage photo of my building for this presentation, but I haven't had much luck, I'm afraid. This photo is from 1924 and taken on 4th Street, just about a block north of where my building is located. Note the tall building on the left. This is a neighborhood landmark known as the Maxwell House Coffee Building. In 1924, this was their West Coast headquarters. You can see their name faintly on the side of the building. If you look very closely to the immediate right, you can see a brick structure with windows peeking through from the street behind, right here. This is my building. Here's another angle of Maxwell House in 1924. This is actually the opposite side of what I just showed you. And again, my building is peeking through from behind there on the left. Here's Maxwell House today, although now it's a WeWork office center. It's had a few changes over the years, as you can see, but we're all still here. This is a better view of what my building looks like today. Originally, those enclosed patios on the first level were loading docks, and they actually stayed that way until the year 2006, when a developer bought the building and converted it to loft condominiums. Inside, my loft is located on the top floor. I have a large bank of windows facing northeast. I'm very thankful to have enough space and a wonderful light quality to work by. Like many artists, I probably work a little too much. So for me, things are best with my studio in my home. Maybe that's better said, my home in my studio. Here's another angle of my workspace, obviously taken at night. This is when you can usually find me neck deep with work. Sometimes I go well into the early morning hours. This is where the magic happens, as they say. I have a custom made Hughes easel and I can accommodate canvases up to eight feet in height. Of course, there are other tasks aside from painting varnishing, crating, shipping, everything else involved in my day-to-day -day of my business all takes place in my loft. I have a little problem with keeping things neat, as you can see, something I'm working on. Every studio needs an assistant. This is Thunder. He's a two-year-old retired racing greyhound. Thunder's still getting used to life off the track right now, but so far, he's been an excellent assistant and does his job very well. Anyway, the reason for all of these images of where I live is to show you that my work and life are very much intertwined. In all honesty, I wouldn't know how to separate them. Living where I do makes me feel connected to history. For me, the railroad serves as a direct link to the past. I am surrounded by it and see it every day. Despite the constant change around here, trains remain the soul of my community, and there's no doubt that living where I do influences the way I see and experience the world. I hope that my paintings capture a small piece of this experience. All right, moving on to section two, let's look at some paintings. I didn't put these in any particular order, but they're all recent paintings and most of them are available at one of the galleries that I work with. I'll talk about that later. Ray Bradbury said, among many things, we must travel to be lost. For me, open doors are portals. They trigger my imagination and take me to places I long to be. 
even if I've never been there before. Ultimately, trains are travelers. This is their true essence and what I hope to capture in my work. Here's a close-up shot so you can see the landscape detail. Many of my paintings focus on the details of train cars. I just love playing with structure, light, and shadows. This is called Too Far. Not all of my paintings have trains as the subject, but for me, the same vernacular is found in other places too. In my neighborhood, great subjects are never too far away. Get it? Graffiti is among the most raw forms of self-expression that I know of. While I am not a graffiti artist myself, I am influenced by it, and obviously it plays a role in how I see. For many, graffiti is nothing more than a random act of vandalism. While this may be true, it also has purpose and value within certain circles. It's a way of communicating to the world that someone exists. The more daring and prolific a graffiti artist is, the more status he or she achieves. This is a large canvas at six feet tall. Cabooses are a rare find in the yards, but this old one is nicely preserved and I'm just a sucker for Santa Fe Red. This is an example of a motion painting. You may have noticed that my paintings are very detail intensive and so they can take quite a bit of time to make. After spending several months focused on a single frame of time, I can say that you really develop a certain appreciation for how quickly life goes by. This is the concept behind my motion series. And here's a close up of the same piece so you can get a level of, see the level of detail. This is among my smaller panels at just 16 inches square. My fascination with trains began more or less as an obsession with details. For me, utilitarian objects are simply fascinating. They are made to be purely functional, but with time and use, their true identities are revealed. The more something is used, the more beautiful I think it becomes. Time and purpose are the main concepts behind all of my paintings, and I can't think of anything better than trains to express this. This is called Alliance. It's seven feet wide. For me, container cars are kaleidoscopic. There are endless color combinations for me to play with. And of course, graffiti serves as a balancing point to the Mondrian-like geometry of the container cars. This is a piece I just finished called Bloom. What started as an idea about change or transformation took on new meaning after the coronavirus hit. Here's a close up so you can get a better look inside. This is at the helm. It's a smaller piece at 16 by 20. We have a large Union Pacific yard in my neighborhood, so these engines are a frequent sight. BNSF engines are also very popular, so you'll see them surface in my paintings from time to time too. This is called Stay the Course, and it's also 16 by 20. 
Weathered paint, rusty textures, and dramatic shadows never fail to capture my imagination. This is called Visitor. This painting is eight feet wide. Once again, I'm exploring the open door. Of course, trains are transient by nature, just as we are. And I wanted this painting to take viewers on a little ride. The background is a place here in Southern California called Joshua Tree. If you've never been, it's a magical desert location. It makes me think about an Aboriginal proverb. It says, we are all visitors passing through time and space. In the end, our purpose can only be to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. This is called Through the Cracks. It's a painting of a local street where you can see three rail bridges that extend from an extremely large rail yard that I often shoot in. You can tell once again, I just love playing with light and shadow. This is against the grain. One of the many freight cars that have visited. I painted this one exactly as I found it. I love seeing all the different hands that touch a car throughout its service. Layers of graffiti tags form an organic patina that transforms an ordinary traveler into something rich and full of history. I often think graffiti tags are like tattoos on old sailors. Each stop on the journey adds another mark. This painting is called Devoted, and it's 50 by 72 inches. It may surprise you to know that I get a little pushback from time to time about graffiti. Not everyone appreciates this detail as I do, but that's okay. This made me think about the role I could play in the perception of graffiti. I thought, what if masterpiece paintings were layered among the tags on a freight car? Would this change how people see graffiti? Currently, I have several more paintings in development just like this, and eventually, I hope to have a show, and I'll call it Yard Masters. And here's a close-up. This is called On the Run and it's seven feet wide. Obviously, another open door concept, which I seem to be obsessed with lately. I don't often paint living things, but sometimes they arrive to help me work through certain ideas. I'm sure a psychiatrist would have a field day about the meaning of a flock of crows. So tonight I've talked about my neighborhood and the inspiration behind my work. And then, of course, I showed you some paintings. So at this point, I thought I would show you what happens to my paintings after they leave my studio. In most cases, I never see them again. But recently, I started collecting imagery of paintings in context of where they happen to land after I ship them out. This is the Seven Bridges Foundation. Currently, they own five of my paintings. This one was a commission from a few years ago called Boundless. At 12 feet, this canvas took nearly a year to complete. The Seven Bridges Foundation is actually one man's personal art collection. In 1992, he established Seven Bridges as a nonprofit foundation with the purpose of supporting living artists. He then made his collection available to the public. So if you have reason to be in Greenwich, Connecticut, you can contact the foundation and make arrangements for a free tour. 
I highly recommend this because it's really quite spectacular. This is a wide angle shot showing on the run, which I talked about in the last section. This is a gallery in Palm Desert where the painting lived until it sold not so long ago. I find looking at art in settings like this fascinating. I love the dialogue that takes place between the various types of art. Of course, I also love seeing freight trains in unexpected places. This is a painting I did a few years ago called Hiding Out. Here it is, hiding out in a gallery library in New York City. This is devoted again. And you can get a sense of the scale of this painting. This is another gallery shot from an exhibition I did in New York City. This is a painting called Passage, shown in a collector's dining room. Seeing how collectors live with art is very appealing for me, not just my art, but art in general. The effect it can have upon someone's home is extremely interesting. When I see my paintings like this, I feel like a little piece of my life becomes part of someone else's. This is an image I came across on Instagram. I don't know the person who posted it, but clearly this was a holiday dinner or celebration of some sort. Anyway, it was a pleasant surprise to see my painting hanging in the background. This is a wonderful art consultant in New York named Marina Granger. Here she is with a friend in my painting labyrinth. And here's one of my paintings in someone's kitchen. This is my painting, Skin Deep, which now hangs in a collector's wine cellar. Once again, the magic of Instagram reveals the life my paintings take on after leaving my studio. This is me holding Stay the Course before being crated and shipped off to a show in Santa Fe. Speaking of Santa Fe, I have an exhibition opening next week called Wanderlust. It will be at the Lou Allen Galleries in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm very excited after the COVID quarantine to have 14 paintings on public display. If you happen to find yourself near Santa Fe in the next month or so, I hope you'll stop in. The gallery practices all safety measures with face masks and social distancing. They actually limit the amount of people in the gallery at any given time, so you'll stay nice and safe while enjoying the art. Here's the gallery web address if you'd like more information. If anyone is interested in learning more about the paintings you've seen tonight, please don't hesitate to let me know, and I'll be glad to have someone from the gallery get in touch with you. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation. There I am. <laughs> All right, thanks, Adam. Well, I have a couple of questions myself and uh, we'll, we'll watch and see if anyone's come in. I, I should have said earlier in the housekeeping, um, if anyone has questions, you can send those to us 
those to us either via the chat or the Q&A functions. Both those that show up on the right uh, lower uh, corner of your screen. Uh, but in the meantime, Adam, I, I, one of the things you said early on kind of struck me that when you're in the field um, taking photographs, you have that philosophy of shoot first and think later. Um, right. But there, there's clearly some some thoughtfulness that goes into your photographs. And so I guess I'd, I'd be interested as a photographer myself just to, to know a little bit about, you know, even if you're if you're maybe just kind of shooting off the off the cuff when you're in the field, still what what catches your eye and what you're looking for? Yeah, well, you know, uh, it's uh, actually something I, I taught myself to do. Um, my thinking is to not think when I'm shooting. I prefer to um, stumble upon something of interest and let only the creative voice in my head speak in the moment rather than go out with a contrived idea of something I'm trying to fulfill. I find that much more exciting. Uh, and it's also very hard to find what you're looking for at any given time. So you kind of have to work with things as you find them. So I shoot quite a bit. That's, that's the wonderful thing about digital photography is I just shoot and shoot and shoot. And I really don't know if I have anything worthwhile until I get back to the studio and upload all of my images in Photoshop. And then I, you know, screen through them and then I find things that I think are cool and whatnot. A lot of my paintings are composites and they come together from multiple photographs. I'll pull a detail from this one and move it over to here. Uh, one of the paintings I showed you tonight, you know, was in a desert landscape. Well, I actually photographed that train here where I live and with a little creative license, I placed it in the desert. Hmm. So. The photograph is not the final result of my work. It's really just a step to get there. So that's how I can get away with not thinking about it. I just keep shooting, and, you know. Well, it's just interesting to me, I mean, to have that, you know, when, uh, when you're photographing, it's, you know, it's this kind of very um, just, you know, first thought, best thought, very zen kind of approach. And then, you know, when you... Yeah, I go, I operate by intuition, like everything else in my life, I just sort of feel my way through it. Uh, but, but yet these paintings are clearly the result of, of very careful planning and, and, a, and a really well thought out creative process. So I guess to me, just the, the comparison and the contrast to that is interesting. Just how it works. Yeah. All right, well, I better stop asking you questions because we've got a bunch coming in. Um, First of all, uh, Phil Burton, uh, who's also in the California, although a little bit north of you up in the Bay Area, Phil asks if you've painted passenger trains, um, any light rail or inner city or passenger stations, just any kind, anything about the rail passenger landscape or environment. Yeah, not a lot. Actually, the very first painting I did of trains was of a passenger train. Uh, and, and I didn't paint it because it was a passenger train. I painted it just because I thought it was cool. It was a vintage train and it had polished metal uh, surface on the exterior and I just love the reflective quality that it had so uh, so that happened to be a passenger train but uh, my approach to the subject is as an artist I'm really not uh, trying to uh, document trains historically or I'm not a preservationist I really don't know a lot about trains other than I just like them and I identify with them so there's also not a lot of passenger trains, you know, in the yards that I explore. So I don't really, uh, I don't always come upon them. I'm not against doing it. If, uh, if I find one and it happens to speak to me, I'm, I'm happy to do it. All right, so we had another question from uh, Philip Cania. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, Philip. But he asked if, uh, if the, uh, the painting with God and Adam on the side of the boxcar in the uh, the Yardmasters series. I love that title. Um, was that actual? Was that uh, painting already on the boxcar? Or was that a, a, a transformative measure that you made as an artist? <laughs> That's the mystery, right? I mean, my <laughs> my objective is to for viewers to to assume that. To, did did he see that? Uh, but the truth is, no. I I uh, I decided uh, I I wanted to play Michelangelo and uh, and and work, uh, work with the figures as he did. So that's the truth behind the painting. Uh, but in all honesty, you know, I, I don't normally uh, talk about that because, you know, I think, uh, I think the mystery of art is, is very important. So 
and I just killed it. <laughs> I, look, well, I look forward to seeing more from uh, from that series, whether uh, whether they existed in real life yeah, or I have only a whole folder or... full of them. I'm I'm really excited to get going on those. Awesome. Uh, all right, so Lou Maxson has two questions here. Uh, first of all, have you or would you ever paint a train or a train line from historical um, photographs or for lines that don't exist anymore? And then what is your favorite train line and one that you wish you could have or will paint in the future? Wow. Uh, well, once again, I, I don't pursue the subject for historical reasons or to document uh, anything specific about trains. It's an emotional pursuit. For me, there's a poetry to these objects, and that's what I'm trying to capture. Uh, but I'm not against doing it. I've been commissioned to do vintage trains. I think I showed one in the presentation of an old steam engine that I did. Um, and when I do vintage subjects, my approach is always from the here and now. Uh, I like to see the patina of time and weathering on it. I don't generally paint trains uh, in their glory days. Uh, to me, they're more interesting and they're more beautiful having, having lived and, uh, and been used. So uh, I, it's, I'm open to it. If, uh, if Mr. Maxon would like to uh, <laughs> chat with me about doing something, by all means, give me a call. Uh, but, um, but in general, no, that's not something that I would ordinarily pursue. What about like the, the photograph you showed of the alleyway that was originally built that had a train line coming through it? Would anything like that ever potentially strike your fancy as a potential painting subject? Uh, as a matter of fact, I've thought about painting that very alley. Uh, I'm still working through some sketches on that. So yeah, you might see something uh, along those lines coming, coming down the pipe. Oh, I hope so. Well, this is something you talked about a good bit anyway, um, but uh, Steve Moscarelli asks uh, just you know, kind of in general, why so much graffiti and, and so much of the work that you take on? Why? Because, uh, yeah, a lot of reasons. Uh, there's, there's something about it that I find very compelling. It's, um, it's a form of expression that is all around me. I mean, you can't avoid it where I live. Um, I don't seek to celebrate graffiti. Uh, I'm not trying to be pro-graffiti or anti-graffiti. Uh, I try and remain neutral. It's a detail, just like rust, grime, weathering, all the things that you see on a train car, it becomes part of the texture and it's part of its history. So there's a certain um, degree of truth, I think, that I want to capture about the subject. And graffiti is part of that. I like your analogy of the, the, the tattoos on old sailor's arms having uh... Uh, my grandfather, who was an old sailor with tattoos on his arms, um, that yeah. sort of analogy really resonated with me. Um, Tony Reavy uh, asks, uh, some of your paintings remind him of photos by Walker Evans and by David Plowden, and he just would uh, like to know, Tony would like to know a little bit more about your artistic influences. Well, I don't. I can't say that I know who those artists are. I'm sorry to say, but uh, but some artists that have influenced me are uh, painters like Richard Estes, John Register, uh, Edward Hopper. Of course, his use of light and shadow is just magical. Um, you know, there's a whole slew of artists. I have a bunch of friends who are artists, and I think I'm influenced by uh, all the art that I see. Um, but as far as uh, you know, I'm not trying to emulate anyone in particular, but I think I take a little piece of all of them and, and they're part of how I see. And I know you got into painting, at least seriously, kind of later in life. Um, yeah. what, what were, what was the, was there a touchstone or was it something that just kind of came about slowly and organically? Was there a big aha moment? How did, how did that all take place? Well, uh, you know, I, I think earlier on in my life, I just didn't have the confidence to uh, pursue what I was really passionate about. Uh, I went to college. Uh, I studied political science. I thought at that point in life I was going to be a lawyer. And uh, after school, I got involved in investment banking and insurance sales, things like that. But I'd always painted. And it was really my hobby. And uh, but, you know, as time goes on, it, uh, it was just something that, that I was very passionate about. 
And, um, you know, I think turning 30 was probably the first uh, milestone in my life where I, I stopped and, and looked back and thought, you know, what am I doing with my life? And what is it I really want to do? And what makes me happy? And everything pointed to painting. So I decided to take it a little bit more seriously. And uh, I signed up for one of those, you know, art in the park art festivals. And uh, I, I collected the handful of paintings that I had and built a display wall and hung them up. And it was the best experience of my life. I quit my job within six months and uh, I've been on the run ever since. Mm -hmm. So Angela at Trains Magazine has a question about uh, process. She asked if you begin with sketches and if so, how long have you spend working on sketches before touching a canvas? You know, I, uh, I do sketch. Um, when I'm trying to work through ideas and compositions, I keep a little sketchbook and I make little thumbnail sketches to sort of compose. And they're not very detailed. They're very loose. Um, but the photography is really where it starts. Everything starts behind the lens of a camera. When I'm out in the field and I find something I think is cool, I just shoot and shoot and shoot. Keep, keep gathering as much visual information as I possibly can. And then I sketch in Photoshop is really where that takes place. So I crop things, I move things around, I alter colors and things like that to better suit the idea that I'm working on. And then what I do is I loosely sketch the composition that I've come up with on the, the canvas that I'm working on. And again, it's a very loose sketch because I work in layers. So if I do something very detailed, it's just going to get lost in the layers of paint. So I start with an underpainting. I block in the basic colors and then layer by layer, I keep adding detail and refinement until the piece starts to take on a life of its own. And uh, that's when I know, you know, it's working. <laughs> and it well, doesn't uh, work, I would add. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Ted Rose, a famous watercolor artist in the, in the railroad community, uh, he liked to say that, um, make sure I can uh, quote this accurately, um, some paintings never resolve, but all are workable. That's very true. I can't argue with that. <laughs> well, Angela had a follow-up question to that, too. Um, just wondering if you've ever documented the stages of your painting, starting with kind of that loose beginning sketch and, and taking photographs of it all the way up to the finished product. I, I have, as a matter of fact. And, you know, I thought about including it in the presentation tonight, except that I had done that very thing in the conversations conference in Lake Forest. So I, I didn't, I wanted to mix it up and, and show you some, some different things tonight. Uh, but yes, I, I have documented step by step a few paintings. I even have a little video of one. So if, uh, if you'd like to reach out to me directly, I'll be happy to share that with, uh, with you or anyone else that's interested. We might be happy to share it on our Facebook page too, if you'd be uh, open to that. Absolutely. Awesome. Let's see, I think we had another one pop up in here too. Doug Nelson asks uh, whether the painter Charles Sheeler was one of your influences. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I actually prefer the term uh, precisionist to photorealist. Mm -hmm. I think it's more accurate sure. to what I do. Although there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of crossover. And uh, I will take note if I ever have the fortune to introduce you again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's okay. I mean, I am a photorealist too. I mean, that's, it's definitely accurate to my process and how I work. Uh, sure. Yes, uh, I love the work of Charles Sheeler, both his photography and painting. And uh, yeah, the industrial subject. I mean, I, you know, I, I like to think that I'm making a contribution towards uh, the same point of view that, 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 that he did. Well, so here's another interesting question from a process standpoint. Um, you know, since you're taking digital photographs and often working in Photoshop to create what it sounds like is kind of a, a digital photo montage that, that might sort of be the, the starting point for a painting, um, uh, Phil asks, why not just use that Photoshop digital montage to make sort of a, a, a final version and then just make digital prints rather than going to all this trouble of, of doing it in oils on canvas? <laughs> you know, I ask myself that question every day. Uh, but, uh, you know, the truth is I'm a painter. 
there's paint running through my veins. And uh, to me, there's, that process is really what I love. And, and, and it's the act of interpreting the image uh, in paint is really, really what, what I love to do. Uh, and if you look closely at the reference photos that I work from, uh, there is a lot of license in, uh, that I take uh, an interpretation. Uh, I, I'm not, my goal is not to replicate a photograph. They do vary when you look at them side by side. Ultimately, I want to make a painting. And the photography is just a step towards that, that goal. Uh, Ron Belheis, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name, Ron, uh, says that he finds the graffiti pieces are like canvases within canvases. Have you ever considered doing a series that includes the graffiti artists themselves? Yeah, you know, with social media, uh, a lot of the graffiti artists actually find me and they do hmm. reach out. Um, uh, you know, I don't know how I would collaborate with another artist on that. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm open to it, um, but um, yeah, we'd have to work through that, I guess. But, uh... It was interesting to me just the way you found some of your paintings on Instagram, uh, even from people that you don't always know. How, how, do you, how do you go about, or what gave you the notion to search on Instagram for your paintings, or how do you go about finding? Well, I'm lucky they tag me and then okay. it shows up on my feed, but sometimes other people see them and they, they point me in that direction say they, they noticed one of my paintings and they just let me know. And that's a really, a great thing I think about social media is just the fact that you can see your work as and how it lives on in other places that you might not have been able to, uh, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Tony Reeve comments again, the growth of graffiti in recent decades on rail cars, public works and elsewhere is a fascinating development. Why do you think it has arisen in our society over the last 40 years or so? Yeah, you know, I don't know that I could answer that uh, accurately, but from my point of view, uh, you know, I think graffiti is, uh, it's, it's the voice of the unheard. And I think it's a means of uh, expression and a way of uh, saying to the world that, that, uh, that someone exists. And trains are great to put graffiti on because if you put your tag on a train and that's who knows where it's going and where else and how far it's gonna reach. So um, yeah, I, I can't say as to why there seems to be more graffiti. I, I have no idea. If you, if you come to my neighborhood, believe me, it's, it's crazy out there. There's, it's just sometimes you, you can barely see the paint on the train if there's so much graffiti layers. So uh, I, I'm not sure why that is, but, but I love it. I lived in Oregon for a while and you know, the Southern Pacific, um, Union Pacific now, former Southern Pacific line that follows I-5 from Portland down to, to California. Um, the, the kind of the joke there was that you could put a brand new boxcar on a train going south out of Portland and when it came back north two weeks later, it would just be covered with graffiti to the point you could even probably see it anymore. Yeah, it's probably true. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a part of, of your work that I've really, I've really appreciated. I mean, as, a, as you know, somewhat of a Traditionalist in railroad photography, I you know, often lament graffiti and and uh, you know miss the days of of clean uh, cleaner trains and cleaner cars. But um, seeing your work's really given me a newfound appreciation for it. I I, I wouldn't say I'm I'm a fan, but I uh, of it particularly. But I'm certainly a fan of your work, and and uh, I really can can understand the the added layers of meaning that it brings, and that you're able to interpret with your art. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, as an afterthought to that last question, um, graffiti has also gotten a lot more notoriety in, in more recent years, and it has become an acceptable art form. And you do see graffiti artists showing work in galleries and museums. So, you know, it's definitely a legitimate art form now. And I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but it is what it is, and it's not going away. So yeah. it's, it's more than just a passing fad. So, you know, I think, I think that just feeds itself. I think people see that and it inspires them and they, they get involved. I mean, you know, there's some beautiful work out there, some really talented artists. I mean, not everything is just spray painting bad words on the side of a building. Some, right. There's some really thoughtful work out there. 
Bob Alkire mentions that since you live in a former industrial area, are you interested in the history of the area and how it influences your paintings? And I know you talked about that a little bit at first, so maybe you could say a little bit more about, about the history of your, of your neighborhood and the influence it has in your work. Yeah, well, I thought I covered that, uh, but, uh, but it is an industrial area. This, this neighborhood came about uh, Victorian age and it was all about trains. It's, it was nothing but tracks through here. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, as time goes on, uh, the neighborhood grew. I think agriculture was the industry of the day back then. Uh, but as times change and economies change, uh, the neighborhood too has changed. Um, it wasn't until the 80s, well, actually, I think in the 70s, this, this area became derelict, I think, as the economy went south and it became too expensive to be here, a lot of businesses left. So we had a lot of abandoned buildings. And then after that, it was artists that came into this neighborhood in the 80s because space was plenty and it was cheap. So uh, you had a lot of artists that flocked to this neighborhood and uh, basically revived it. And um, then, you know, as time went on, it, it actually became kind of fashionable to, uh, to live in a loft and to live downtown. And the real estate got expensive and got crazy. And, uh, you know, here we are today. So uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not, but that's a little bit of the history of, of the neighborhood. And Bob, if you join late, Adam did talk about this more at the beginning, and we'll, we'll be posting this video on our, our YouTube channel later this week, so you can go back and catch that part of it, too. Um, Adam, I did want to just uh, mention, um, or just kind of revisit the, the notion of motion in your paintings, because that was something that, that really struck me as, as, you know, one of many things that I find unique and fascinating about your work is, is this conveyance of motion through you know, the very still medium of paint, in some ways more still than a photograph, I think. Um, and uh, I really like some of the things you said about that, but I might, I, I, if you could just talk a little bit more about some of these, these series of, of paintings and of, of conveying motion and, and, and what that means to your work and what you're trying to express there. Well, it's all about time is really what they represent and how, how fleeting life is. And um, to, uh, take a moment, a single frame of time, and to render it in such detail and spend months, literally, on a painting to, to capture that particular moment of time, I find that a very interesting balance. And uh, it makes me appreciate how quickly life flies by. And uh, really, that's, that's what these paintings are about. I turned 40 last year and, and just notice and it's always been a, the case, but I think even more so in life, I just noticed the fact that memories don't flow linearly. They pop up in these little vignettes uh, as you look back on your life. And I, I, I feel like there's a parallel there with, with, you know, kind of your fascination with time and motion and how you're capturing that. Yeah, you know, when I'm in the flow of painting, actually sitting at my easel and working at a painting, that's when those kind of thoughts pop into my head. I don't always have a meaning in mind when I sit down and make a painting. It isn't until I step back after I'm done with the painting and reflect upon the experience that I understand what I was working on. It's all hindsight. Yeah, interesting. I love the, the aspect of doors as portals and gateways in some of your recent work, too. And, and uh, of, of all those, I think maybe the one that struck me the most is the, the butterflies and that splash of color with the dark shadow of the door behind them and then their shadows falling on the floor of the car. Uh, what was your inspiration for that? Yeah, you know, uh, that, that piece was a real struggle for me. Some paintings, you just sit down and they, they almost paint themselves. In other paintings, it's just, uh, it's just an arm wrestle uh, the entire time. And that particular painting was very challenging for me. Uh, I think it came at a time in my life where I was seeking to make changes. And uh, <laughs> You know, I don't want to get too specific about that, but I was contemplating uh, moving in other directions with my work and my business and whatnot. So, you know, that painting started out with that, with that in mind, but it was a particularly challenging painting for me uh, for a lot of reasons. And, and I'm talking in the technical sense uh, because painting, painting things in shadows and working with such dark tones is, is really tricky, at least for me. 
And uh, so I, I actually repainted that piece at least four times until I was satisfied with how it appeared. You know, the butterfly aspect, it, it actually, the idea was born uh, with, with graffiti in mind. I actually thought it would be interesting to have the butterflies sort of flying out from a, from a piece of graffiti on the side of a train. But the more I thought about it, you know, in the sketch phase, uh, it, it made more sense to place them in, uh, in the chamber of the, of the freight car. So, um, that's what I came up with. Yeah. I, uh, what else can I say about that? Uh, I don't know. Let me think about that. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear more. Maybe we could uh, even run a short little feature in the magazine at some point. Or a longer one with more paintings, too. I'd love to do that. Um, uh, Todd Halamka, another of our board members, uh, who's an architect in Chicago, um, enjoyed hearing about the scale of your paintings, about how they're very large with, uh, with these extreme areas of detail. And he's curious if you have ever explored very small paintings with large details as a contrast to that. Yeah, actually, uh, I've done that very thing. Uh, you know, earlier on when I started the train series, that's exactly what I did. Hmm. The scale of the painting is directly related to the scale of my studio and what I can accommodate. And my first studio was actually a very small space. So I really was limited to doing very small easel size panels. And that's exactly what I did. I, I focused on details, but you know, at full scale on a small panel. And, uh, and that was fun. And really that's what it was about. I think I mentioned in the presentation that, that my, uh, my interest in the subject began as an obsession with the details. So I painted a lot of utilitarian, you know, handles and hinges and brake wheels and a lot of things. I did actual wheels of the train and things like that. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, from time to time, those, it's, it's just fun to go back to that and do pieces like that. You know, I've been doing more uh, complex compositions and larger canvases uh, lately, but, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm down. Give me a call. Let's do something together. <laughs> well, it sounds great. Um, well, I think we have gotten through all the questions that came in. Um, and I know we're uh, coming right up on our, our, uh, our one hour uh, time slot here. So, um, Adam, thank you so much. If there's anything else you'd want to say, or just maybe even just a reminder of your website and gallery uh, as we close out here. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to uh, reconnect with you and to uh, share what I've been up to. And uh, thank you for, uh, for everyone for, uh, for, for joining in to this presentation. And I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, my website is my name. It's adamnormandin.com, and you can get any information you need about where I'm showing or what's what I'm working on, uh, or just write me directly, and I'll be happy to answer you. My show opens on the 10th at the Lou Allen Galleries in Santa Fe, and uh, I think it'll be up uh, for about a month or so. So, uh, so you, can, you can contact them as well, and they'll be very glad to uh, provide any information you need. Great. Well, I hope it's a wonderful show and thank you so much for sharing your work with us and making some time with us this evening. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, we are planning a couple, well, several more of these. Uh, I think our next one's going to be around the middle of July. We plan to announce that in the next couple of days. Look on our website. We'll have this posted up on our YouTube channel by the, uh, by the end of the week. And uh, we're getting lots of thanks coming in from the Q&A in the chat. I think everyone really enjoyed it. And uh, Adam and Allison, uh, Allison, I know, had a lot of uh, work on the tech side. Sitting right here. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both. And Adam, thanks just so much for sharing your work with us. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And I uh, hope to see you at some of our future uh, virtual events and at our uh, virtual conference September 19th and in person just as soon as the world will allow. So, Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Scott. And I'll look forward to all those things. Oh, uh, yeah, us too. And uh, let's stay in touch. Keep up the great work. Thank you, sir.